Hi guys, I've done this video before, so on this take two, let me kick off with a short semantics issue. If I start with something negative like, I feel bad, and then negate that by saying, I don't feel bad, everyone can understand that not feeling bad means feeling okay, the opposite. So why am I telling you this? Well, Muslims, the, you know, the, the women and the men who believe gods can exist and who believe that there is evidence for the existence of their personal creator, God, these Muslims must believe that the Quran is the direct, unaltered, inerrant word of their creator, God, in the form of a book. So what I'm looking at here is whether this belief is indeed justified. Allow me to write down two sentences. Number one, you must stop at a pedestrian crossing. You know, where people try and cross the road. We all know this. Number two, you are prohibited to stop at a pedestrian crossing. Are these identical statements? In what context and by using what trick? Could you get the sentence where you are commanded not to stop, where you are in fact prohibited to stop at a pedestrian crossing, to mean that you should stop at a pedestrian crossing somehow. Well, exactly, you can't. Muslim apologists can. Now let me expand this example a bit to make this more clear. Take a, a car driver, and amongst other things, this is what is commanded, and everybody knows it. No speeding, stop at a pedestrian crossing, don't use your phone. It's quite common, everybody who drives a car knows these. But now, what happens if you prohibit or forbid this? It now becomes what is prohibited, not what is commanded, but what is prohibited. No speeding, stop at a pedestrian crossing, don't use your phone. So let's start with the easy one, the second one, the one in the middle. So if you are prohibited to stop at a pedestrian crossing, you must not stop. This is pretty easy to understand, right? But not for Muslim apologists. So what happens if I write this in a different way? Like, what is commanded is no speeding and stop at a pedestrian crossing and don't use your phone. So we can still understand the three rules. Well, Muslim apologists somehow can't. Now, if I take the second version again and now shorten the what is prohibited to simply don't, we can still get the message. Don't stop at a pedestrian crossing. Everybody understands this, I think. But Muslim apologists can't. Taking the slightly more complicated no speeding example, we have no speeding, which is now prohibited. Don't not speed, a double negative. So if I prohibit speeding, a driver is not allowed to exceed the speed limit. But what if I prohibit this not speeding? So not speeding is sticking to the speed limit. Prohibiting this means that you must speed, i.e. go faster than the speed limit. It's actually quite easy to understand once you break it down. Now, most of apologists, however, will squirm and lie to avoid understanding the sentence or this, this structure. Because if they don't, they need to question their belief. The belief that the Quran is the direct, unaltered, inerrant word of their creator God. How so? Well, the Quran claims in 482, do they not consider the Quran carefully? Had it been from other than Allah, in other words, others from, from a God, they would surely have found therein much contradictions. So, if the author is a God, there can be no contradictions. If there is a contradiction, a single contradiction, the book can't have been authored by the Islamic God. It's that easy. If the contradiction is due to a simple scribal error like the one I'm going to show here, then the Quran is wrong, claiming that A, there are no contradictions, and B, this God protects the contents and each word of the Quran. So there's quite a bit at stake here. Now, let me just clarify this here. Every non-Muslim who's read the Quran knows how badly it is written. Much of it is simply incomprehensible. But I don't really care whether or not there are mistakes in an old book. I would accept it as normal. But the Quran makes claims and Muslims echo these claims, even today. So if there were no extraordinary claims, I wouldn't worry at all. But since these claims regarding inerrancy are made, we should be able to verify them. 
So what happens if we now apply what we've just seen up until now to the Quran? For example, it says in 17.23, Your Lord has decreed that you not worship except him and to parents good treatment. So these things are commanded. You not do this and do this. Yeah, it's a very common thing that you find all over the Quran. And even Kathir agrees this command is valid for both and, well, because you have the and. Quite straightforward. And it's repeated many times. And even Kathir and other tafsir authors and scholars agree with this. So the problem is that now we have a sentence in the Quran which says the opposite in 6151. I will recite to you what your Lord forbids you, not ascribe any partners to him, and ye shall be good to your parents. Now, the entire passage has several parts. So the Quran talks about not having more than one God, being good to your parents, not getting children out of poverty, don't do indecent things, don't kill us aloud, stay away from the property of under his forum, be just whatever it means, be just whatever it means. So in total, there are 10 different parts in sentences 6, 151 to 153. But from these, only the first three are prohibited. All others are normal commands. So from those first three, I'll just focus on the first two to make my point very clear. And if you want, you can take the rest as context, but that does not change anything at all. Now, tafsirs by various scholars simply repeat what the Quran says. And Ibn Kathir even elaborates on the fact that there are three things in this group, not just a single one. The, the don't commit shirk prohibition, and others realize there's a problem and try to change the verb into a noun or adjective and then come up with suggestions like sacred duty. Really? Is eating pork forbidden or a sacred duty? <laughs> come on. So the scholars don't help apologists, no matter how dishonest they are. So the Quran in ancient Arabic says over and over, command number one, don't commit shirk. I don't worship other gods or idols. And command number two, treat parents well. Understood. Now take 6151. It is forbidden, number one, don't worship other gods. Forbidden, number two, treat parents well. Well, understood. Uh, whoops, not really. Because if it is forbidden not to worship other gods, then it is commanded that you do. Just like we had a bit earlier, a double negative, which most Muslims simply skip and read as it is forbidden to commit shirk or it is forbidden to worship other gods. So it is forbidden to worship other gods. This would make sense. But the Quran still has the word not. So the Quran does not say it is forbidden to worship other gods. It says it is forbidden not to worship other gods. Now, come on. I mean, even Muslim apologists must see this now. If it is forbidden not to stop doing something, you need to continue doing it. And just to make this very clear, here is the wording in Arabic, okay? Not a translation, straight from the Quran. Say, come, I will recite what has prohibited, not decreed or commanded, but prohibited, harama, your Lord to you that not or that do not associate or commit shirk with him anything and then the parents where you do good to them and so on the two operative words here are prohibited and then the elements which are prohibited where the first part is not associate so it is prohibited not to associate a double negative which makes it you must associate other gods with allah Let's take the second part, which in my eyes is a lot easier to understand. Number one, treat parents well. And then number two, don't treat parents well. Because it says in the Quran, it is forbidden to treat parents well, or it is forbidden to do good to your parents. And this one is more obvious, I think. It's an, a clear opposite, a clear contradiction. So for some reason now, the, instead of being honest and accepting that there is something wrong here, the defense mechanism kicks in. And Muslim apologists will now start lying and deceiving. They question my character, my ability to think. They attack my translation skills. Come on, when I'm using the Arabic of the Quran, not really a translation. I'm going word for word using only the Arabic. Because all I do is focus on the Arabic text where it uses the word haram as a verb, meaning 
someone prohibits something. Can the Arabic haram mean something else, like giving a positive command? So it says, you are commanded to eat pork, or you are commanded to pay lots of interest, and you are commanded to have as much sex as you can outside of marriage. I don't think so. Here are some sentences in the Quran using haram as a verb to prohibit something. And I think it's pretty clear that haram can mean only one thing and cannot be used as a positive command to do something. It is very clear this only has one single action, prohibiting. So 6151, I will recite to you what you, Lord, forbids you, not ascribe for any partners, you shall be good to parents and do not kill your children because of uh, poverty or whatever. If I look at these items in the sentence, it is true I'm leaving out the remaining parts as they're irrelevant. And it confuses those even more who are not used to textual analysis if I do this for all ten. But why would anyone think that if I have a shopping list, I only buy the top item on the list and go home? And the items here are clearly a list, as is the case in almost the entire Quran where they come up in this combination. And the tafsirs also confirm this 100%. That there is a word and does not always signify a new sentence, not at all. So we have a header as title and three parts it refers to. Don't ascribe any partners. Don't not ascribe any partners. Be good to your parents. Don't be good to your parents. Don't kill your children. Don't not kill your children. Now, what part of this is unclear? What here is ambiguous? Just because two of them have a double negative should not throw any halfway intelligent reader. But this is the problem. Muslims don't really read the Quran. They skim over it, if at all, to get confirmation and see the sentences they think they know. I, however, I read the Quran not as confirmation, but as information as a text to learn about the contents and not to verify what I already think I know. And some Muslims simply leave out a word here and there to somehow twist it to have it say what they want it to say. And that is not honest. Others are taught to not take the words individually and to focus on the don't commit shirk part. So most Muslims are not even aware of the glaring contradiction here and simply skip over it. Scholars have, of course, been aware of this for centuries, but kept quiet about it, of course. So the contradiction is there. Treat parents well. Don't treat parents well. It is now up to the individual Muslim what they will do with this information, whether they accept that the text is man-made and this is a typical scribal error, or whether they now have to doubt that a God wrote this in this form and in this way. And if yes, is unable to protect the text from contradictions and finally accept that the textual mystery is over. Well, good luck and thanks for your time.